opportunity now. This is our startup spotlight on founders, and we get to hear from 11 different early stage startup companies founded by some remarkable entrepreneurs. And one of our hopes for today, we know that entrepreneurial networks are really important. So one of our hopes is that there'll be people in the audience who will have good insights or suggestions or connections to help um, connect these founders to, the, to your networks. And if, as you're listening about these companies, you find that to be true, please follow up with them later in the day and make the connection. So here's how the spotlight's going to work. Each founder will come up and give us an exceedingly brief two-minute summary about their company. And then we will have a panel of investors who will be giving them a little bit of feedback. Um, this is all going to happen super fast. And so for the founders, there'll be someone with a card who's going to show you you've got one minute left, you've got 30 seconds left. Um, so the, the founders themselves will introduce themselves when they come up to give their presentation. But I'd like to introduce you in the meantime to our three panelists. Starting with Sarah in the far left. Sarah's a general partner at Maven Ventures, a seed venture fund specializing in consumer software. She mentioned before that they pay a lot of attention to consumer trends. Everything from consumer social to digital health to consumer applications of AI right now. Charles Hudson is the founding founding and managing partner of Precursor Ventures in the center here. Uh, he's a graduate of the Stanford GSB and of Stanford as an undergrad student and is a lecturer for the class we teach on entrepreneurship and diversity. And Joe Zhu uh, currently leads PairX, where she invests in really early stage startup companies, often as sort of the first check in, helping founders go from zero to one. Before she joined uh, Parex, she created, she founded a YC-backed machine learning company, worked in um, product at Uber, DoorDash, and Cameo, and did investing at Andreas and Horwitz. She has both an MBA and a master's in education from Stanford. So thank you all for being part of the Startup Founder Spotlight. Um, I know that your insights and your, your great thinking will be helpful not only to the founders who will be on the stage, but the ones who are in the audience as well. So with that, let's invite our first Startup Spotlight founder up to introduce themselves and tell us about their company. All right. Hello, friends. My name is Dr. James Lott. I'm a pharmacist, public policy professional, and the CEO of Scripted. Before I get started, I have a brief question for you all. By a show of hands, how many of you got your vaccine or a COVID test at the pharmacy during the pandemic? Wow, okay. That was more than I had planned for. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, there's a big trend going on in healthcare right now. Access has always sucked, but I think we're finally doing something about it. Today, access to healthcare is limited, it's frustrating and inconvenient, and it's about to get worse. By 2034, we're going to be short 134,000 physicians, mostly in primary care. So if you need something really critical, an EpiPen or something else, you'll have to wait six weeks to six months to, for your doctor to get it. And that's just silly. What we are working on is a way to change that. We're unlocking this opportunity for $40, $40 billion for pharmacists. We already know that 300 million people got that, or 300 million vaccines were given at a pharmacy during the pandemic. And right now in legislation, there are 60 bills across the country changing the scope of practice of a pharmacist so they can do more. But to capture this, it's really hard. Um, most pharmacies struggle to ever start for four reasons. Number one, they need to get paid by insurance, not by cash. They have to regulate um, complexities in sta from state to state. They need to get trained and they have to uh, focus on the day-to-day -day operations to make it sustainable. We're the first platform that takes end-to-end -end all of the issues with that, uh, with that with a turnkey solution for pharmacies so they can manage and run these services at scale. In 2022, we had 1,950% growth. In the next probably six to eight weeks, we will be closing our first enterprise customer. Essentially, we are making, we're aligning the incentives so that patients can get care at the pharmacy and pharmacies can make more money. We're raising $2.5 million, closing around at the end of the month. Thank you so much. Uh, great.
Great job, thank you. Um, could you tell me in one, in one sentence, uh, who is the buyer of your product and what is the problem you're solving for them? Sure. The buyer of our products are decision makers in pharmacies from large enterprises to mom and pops. They would have to build this market from the ground up. It's extremely complex as you can imagine and we make that super simple. We've developed everything that they need from start to finish. Uh, what, are they, um, what are they doing today instead of using a solution like yours? They're most 99.5% are not doing anything, but they want to because they know the consumer demand is there. Cool. Thank you. Um, and you've, uh, you've been brave by asking a question and you've learned now that sometimes it doesn't turn out the way, the way we, we've expected. So yeah. uh, I think that's, that's one piece of uh, just something to think about in, when you're pitched is you never know what your investors, VCs will get asked sometimes like, hey, how many times have you blanked? And sometimes I'm like, uh, the answer is zero and I know they don't want me to say zero right now. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a risky yeah. move. <laughs> a lot of people got their vaccines at pharmacy, so I commend you all. <laughs> Awesome. No, um, I mean, the growth is, is incredible, so congratulations. Uh, a question I just have is, when you think about the different types of markets, so with pharmacies you mentioned vaccines, what are your specific other verticals that you target? Yeah, so pharmacists are trying to get low acuity care in the, in the pharmacy, so things like birth control, a new prescription, treating a urinary tract infection, something really common in women, getting a COVID, strep, or flu test. Now, something that is really surprising that we've seen We've been talking to enterprise companies lately a lot, and now the payers are coming to them, asking them to join programs. They don't know where to get started. They don't have any technology to, on the front end or the back end, and they're coming to us to say, can you build this so we can interact and get paid with payers? That's been really exciting lately. Absolutely. And how do you think about HIPAA compliance? When you have a vertical SaaS solution anytime, especially in healthcare, um, the question is always, how do you think about like the storage of user information and like the, the security behind that? Yep. Very important. When we started the product, we built for two things. Number one is for time of the pharmacist because they're really busy. Number two is for basically patient safety because uh, we knew that question was going to come up everywhere we went. Um, and we have third party vendors that audit us to make sure that we're remaining HIPAA compliant. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, hello ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet all of you. My name is Sam Badu. Um, I am founder and CEO of Flurry. Flurry is a membership-based family care solution for immigrants, helping them pay for health care for their families back home without sending money transfers. Now, 10 years ago, I moved to the United States, started out as an undocumented immigrant, joined the military to get my citizenship, and became a software developer. It sounded great, and I thought everything was amazing. Until 2020, when my grandmother got sick in Ghana, like most immigrants, started sending money back home thinking everything would be solved. It didn't. She ended up passing away because she ended up going to a traditional healer instead of a hospital to get care, and that's how I lost my grandmother. Turns out this is a huge problem for a lot of immigrants who live here. Send money transfers as pretty much the only way in which we provide care back home. $630 billion a year, that's what immigrants are sending. But 83% of people are sending this money primarily because of healthcare or healthcare emergencies, paying between seven to $12, 12% uh, in fees for this. Most of them would want to do anything else but transfer money, but there isn't a solution other than this default. The interesting thing about it is Flurry is solving for this. How do we do that? We operate a system of escrows in emerging countries as well as having family care managers in these countries. It allows us to pre-validate the care that the family members or beneficiaries of these immigrants need in order for us to prepay for that care so then they're able to make trusted payments here without sending that money and losing it in diversion or uh, misappropriation. Now, today, what we have is about 3,200 uh, members using Flurry to provide care for their families. And in the next few months, we're launching Flurry for Business, which is where our ads come in. 
we're talking to companies that are over-indexed on immigrant workers, such as hospitality, hospice, assisted care living, non-physician healthcare jobs who have a lot of immigrants. We want to work with these to provide Flurry as a benefit to most immigrants to allow them to better take care of their families back home. Thank you. This is awesome. I feel like this is such an unaddressed but large market. I think like 650 billion is, is a huge TAM to, to go after. Um, maybe the first question I would just have is, how do you actually work with the local providers, banks, right, to, to do remittance as well as escrow, as well as uh, the healthcare providers across all these emerging markets? How do you source them? How do you find them? How do you vet them? Great question. So I used to work at Cigna Global um, on the expatriate healthcare side. Um, what we're actually doing is eliminating the need for remittances, so it's death to the money transfer. What that means is we operate our escrows independently in these countries, and with the family care managers that we hire, we coordinate the care, partnering with health insurance companies, uh, last mile healthcare providers, to enable us to prepay the care, validate it, so the immigrants here are assured that they're able to pay for that. So that's what we manage in all of these countries. And we cover six African countries today and growing. Got it. So are you going on the ground to make these partnerships happen? Yes, we actually do. Got it. Um, no, that's awesome. And I guess when you think about other emerging markets, because I think that's that's a lot of it is in like Southeast Asia and LATAM, yes. how do you think about like localization or a lot of like the cultural nuances? Like how scalable do you think that could be across non-African countries? Extremely, extremely scalable. In every country, we hire first and foremost our family care managers. These are people who live and understand the healthcare system, usually with a background in public health. And then we partner with providers who uh, bring us the physicians, their provider uh, network, and we work with them. So there's a lot of local content and local knowledge, and most of our employees are actually in the countries. And so in every country we go, we replicate the playbook, bring on our provider partners, and that's how we're able to execute. That's awesome. And I guess to you, what is like the biggest, um, you know, like what would be something that you would think is like the biggest problem or impediment for your growth? Um, right now, it is how to actually scale acquisition, mm -hmm. right? We started off working with immigrant associations, uh, going, talking to churches and going in there. It's extremely manual, extremely uh, uh, difficult. That's why we're looking at the companies that hire most of these immigrants, where they're taking their salaries and having to send them back home. And so we want to sell to them as benefits. They provide this for their immigrant workers, uh, are able to retain them, increase productivity, but provide this benefit that gives them peace of mind knowing their family members back home are taken care of. Awesome. This is great. I just want to provide one, one piece of structural feedback. I thought it was really great in your deck that even at the first slide, I already knew what the company did. And there are so many presentations I get where the first five slides are about the market and the problem. And it takes too long to figure out what is this company actually doing. And so I think from a structure standpoint, the way you quickly got into what the offering was and why was really well done. Thank you very much. Good morning. Enjoy your meal. I am Min Chen, founder of YZ, and I do want to ask you a question. How many of you have gone into a store looking for a product and you couldn't find it? thing is everybody in the room, right? Your bad customer experience translates into $1 trillion of annual losses in the CPG industry. And most of the time, it is not because of lack of inventory, but a retail execution problem when products are not displayed at the right location when you were ready to buy them. There are two main causes of this problem. First is that companies do not have reliable shelf level data to plan the optimal product assortment per store. Second, even if they could do so, they don't have the tools to manage the complexity. Most processes at the store level are still done manually, where field employees have to eyeball the products to ensure they are displayed correctly. YC solved this pro two of the two problems with our breakthrough on-device AI solution, meaning we don't require connection to the internet to process information and yet return in results in one second. Field employees use YC 
to drive down shelf audits from 20 minutes to two minutes. YC returns data instantly, even when connection is unstable, like what happens in most stores. Out of stocks, assortment, pricing, plan work compliance is calculated immediately to tell the employee what to do to prevent millions of dollars in lost sales. This breakthrough is going to enable ma the mass adoption of AI in the industry, so much so that we were featuring IEEE, Hover of Thoughts, and the World Economic Forum. We released the breakthrough in Q3 last year, had $5 million in organic leads, and have already converted $1 million from global brands that want to use YC in many markets. We're a team of experienced and diverse founders who want to team up with investors to transform this multi-trillion dollars industry. Thank you. I just want to make sure I to clarify one thing. So do you sell to the brands, not to the retailer? We can sell to the whole spectrum from the brands to the retailers. We're starting with the brands because they have less control of, over what, what is happening at the shelf level, and they have been looking for this technology from 10 to five years. Mm -hmm. um, the customer we recently won, the global RFP, they were already using three solutions, but they couldn't adopt this worldwide because of the offline capability. Yeah. And are most of the brands you're working with, are, are they distributing directly to retailer or through some distributor? I'm just trying to make sure I understand sort of that full supply chain your customers. Yes, well, so we cover the whole spectrum. Okay. We have customers, I mean, within one customer, think of a global customer, depending on the country, sometimes they sell directly to the retailer, sometimes they do that through a distributor, mm -hmm. sometimes they do that through a broker or a bottler mm -hmm. if it is in beverage yeah. segment. So we design YC to work in in any of those conditions, either as an extension of a solution or a standalone solution for their employees or their broker's employees. And then last question, how's the accuracy of the AI today and sort of where do you need to get in order to meet the needs of your customer? Above 90%. So it's equivalent to any AI that runs in the cloud with a lot of GPUs. We only require one processor that is in the phone. That's awesome. So when you say it's like AI on edge, is the inference being done it, itself like on device and then you're sending it to the cloud uh, without internet though? We don't have to process it in the cloud. Everything is processed in the phone. So okay. as soon as they take the video or the pic picture, it's processed in the phone. What we send to the clouds are the results and sometimes they picture themselves because they, the company wants to keep that for auditing purposes. And that happens usually when the person leaves the store or they move to another section of the store where the connection is better. Got it. And when you think about uh, monetization, is it like a SaaS fee or are you doing a guarantee on the accuracy of the amount of shrink that or like the amount of, um, I guess, from what happens before using your product? Can you guarantee that by using your product there is a lift in terms of um, being able to match what is the actual inventory levels to what is predicted? Like, are there any like guarantees you offer? So the, the first question was, what is the business model? Yeah. It's a SaaS model. We charge, depending on whether it's a, as an extension or a standalone, we charge rec uh, recurring fee per person or per usage, depending on how many visits they do. The second question was um, how we measure the, or how we provide warranties. So the first KPI that companies look for is actually efficiency because this industry has a lot of shortage of workers and with our solution they can drive down like 10x what they are doing at the shelf level and 10x per category in any given supermarket there are 300 categories and multiply that by tens of thousands of stores and people around the world um, so that's the first kpi the second kpi is data they don't have enough data they don't have reliable data and then the third is how much more data we can give them that they don't already have. So that right now they're manually collecting operational data, out of stocks, assortment, maybe pricing. With our solution from the same picture, we can get even strategic data. Who are your competitors? Who are the new ones coming in? What are the trends over time? Um, eventually get into predictive analytics. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, while I was at DoorDash, I was leading the grocery vertical, and one of the main problems we had was being able to understand exactly, because grocers sometimes don't know it themselves, and brands don't know either. So even like as a third party, like logistics provider, we wanted to understand if someone placed an order for um, a certain amount of, I don't know, like milk or eggs, 
um, doing a replacement if that brand doesn't exist was really hard. So yeah, this is like a real issue. So thank you so much for, for providing like, thank an you. overview. My name is Tisha and I have spent the past 20 years as a leadership team member. Leadership teams are responsible for determining growth outcomes and ensuring that they have allocated enough resources to meet them. There are 230,000 leadership teams in our target market and they will be spending $117 billion by 2027 to align their strategy and resources. I don't know about y'all, but I have been in the room trying to deal with this mess, <laughs> especially with hyper data growth. The problem is that a disconnected strategy from execution can have a company not achieve their growth outcomes, and it wastes hundreds of hours, which also equals lots of dollars. One of the secrets is that success depends on people actually being aligned, and that requires a common language and a framework by which you maintain that alignment. So we thank goodness for C-Model. Our proprietary decision engine combines data, human knowledge, and artificial intelligence to help leaders have an easy way to align their strategy, resources, and their team so that they can grow. Let me show you how it works. Companies come to C-Model and they bring us what they want to accomplish. They give us their data and then our AI immediately produces a set of outcomes, KPIs, and actions that they can take. At that point, they can go in and update that plan, share those details with their team, or update the critical assumptions in their financial model. After they've done that, they can go back into the KPI management system and look at whether or not they are on or off track. If they find a KPI that's off track, they can then measure new actions against that KPI in the leadership team meeting. They can even compare one action to another action. After they've aligned on which action they want to take, they can then re-update all of their plans, including pushing information from C-Model into tools like Asana and Workday to update the project flow. They can do this over and over again. C-Model has eight customers already making better decisions faster, and we've got 220K in ARR. We launched in July of last year. We're currently raising $1.5 million in order to accelerate product development and customer acquisition. So thank you so much. Hi, Tisha. Um, uh, you've got excellent uh, presence and delivery. Um, so thank really you. well done on the pitch. And a hallmark of a great pitch is as I would write down the questions I was going to have for you, the next slide would answer that question. Okay. And so I think, uh, I think you've done, a, um, done your homework and you've delivered a great uh, presentation in that. One thing I particularly liked was up front putting 230,000 teams spend $117 billion on this. When we were talking earlier about like what is the math of a VC, I need to see a number that's a market size and it needs to have a B behind it and ideally it's a very big number. And so I think you, you delivered on that. Um, a question I have for you, can you give me of your eight customers, what is the most common reason or specific example that someone uses your product for? Yeah, so when they're trying to explore paths to growth, right? So most companies are seeking profitability in some way, if, if not right now, later. And so in order to explore those paths, you need to know what it's going to cost and how much it's going to deliver you. And uh, so. I would um, make that possibly even more explicit okay. in your presentation because self-service decision intelligence is um, more vague than what you just told me, is we help businesses unlock growth. And so figuring out how you can pitch that and 
share that that's explicitly what you're doing. I think, especially in raising capital, VCs right now are interested in things that are going to grow revenue, I think more so than interested in things that will reduce costs just because of the market that we're in. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I would make that possibly even more um, explicit. And my um, last question, when you sell to your customers, are you replacing something existing that they're doing or are you a new buy for them? Yeah, so we're, we're gonna replace a number of things, people, and uh, tools. So uh, one of our customers was, uh, one of the first things they did was got rid of Power BI. So there, there's, because data summaries don't necessarily help solve problems, so we're able to um, really disrupt some of the business intelligence flow. In addition to consultants who come into companies and try to help people to grow because we've got, uh, our, the intelligence in our system provides recommendations and observations on data that people do today. Great, thank you. Yeah. I love the live demo. Like I think having a clear articulation of exactly what the user problem was and then showing the end product was awesome. Um, one question that I had when I was watching it was, when you mentioned that it's an AI solution, I feel like it's kind of in vogue right now where probably like 80% of the deal flow I see has some element of AI. And the question I always have is, what, like walk me through your tech stack, exactly how are you generating this? A lot of it is you know, built on like Anthropic or OpenAI, so maybe you can walk us through like how exactly you're generating. Yeah, so the first part of our AI that you will have noticed in creating the plan is uh, we've done uh, prompt engineering on mm -hmm. ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the first part. The second part is on our, we use machine learning in uh, compiling all of the actuals and projections and uh, the, the data elements. Mm -hmm. And then we have something called a recommendation engine, uh, which is the third part um, uh, of, of our AI, which is also uh, going to, uh, as we continue to develop it, utilize ChatGPT. That part right now, we're curating using machine learning, but it'll, uh, it'll be adjusted down the line. For sure. Mm -hmm. Maybe one suggestion would just be having a slide indicating exactly what that tech stack is mm -hmm. and you using proprietary data. So it's not just yeah. a thin layer on top of open AI. That's and I right. think that'll like really, really take this home. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Hello everyone, my name is Kelvin Umechiku. Um, I'm with my, together with my co-founder at Dayton G. We're building the mobile commerce OS for African sellers. Now for over 100 million small business owners in Nigeria and in Africa together, there are over a lot of these businesses, for a lot of these businesses, commerce is entirely offline. Yes, it's entirely fragmented in such a way that most businesses are trying to sell through multiple channels, but these channels do not communicate with one another at all. Um, commerce is also very inefficient. How? You know, most of these small business owners use physical books to, to record their sales, so th it's literally like a black hole. They don't necessarily have any data to basically help them with you know, financing, when, when they want to get credit, or even business intelligence. And what we've basically built out is a, a, a mobile platform that basically helps these business owners to move their businesses online. So we provide them with a, with a website, help them with engaging their customers, and also um, recording their sales, but also getting um, intelligence for their, for their small businesses. Um, we've re released this early in, in 2021, and since then we've had over 50,000 small businesses to, to try out the product. Um, we've done over 300,000 orders, um, and you know, uh, process over $25 million in GMV, and we raised $4.2 million last year led by um, Base 10, and we have some of our backers um, right here. Um, the goal for us is basically to be that platform that basically helps remove the complexities for small businesses, um, especially non-tech-savvy businesses, and basically make it easy for them to be able to manage and grow their businesses from their mobile phone. Yeah, um, and the one thing that is key for us is the interoperability that we basically um, make possible, which before now is, has, has never before been done on, on, on the continent. So right now we're seeking for experts and mentors and potential um, investors later in the future that would you know, work with us towards um, helping us figure out things like um, monetization and expansion um, into new markets. Thank you. Nice job, Kelvin. I had a 
the question every time I hear SMB merchant, I, I instantly my brain goes to Shopify as kind of the most common platform. So I'm just curious for your customers, what are some of the unique things that the existing tools don't allow them to do or don't support them on that you're able to do with Bumpa? Okay, so first we'll be called the Shopify for Africa. That's like there the time that we started. Anyway. <laughs> um, but one of the things that is critical for us is how we've built um, a solution that is tailored to the African market. Um, we're based in, in Nigeria and Africa, so we, we understand the, you know, the, the different nuances. So first is that we are built first on mobile. Yes, we are we're mobile first. Um, and number two is that we've been able to take um, a lot of the complex things and, and broken it down. So for instance, one of the things that you'll notice here in the West is that you know, you're able to, if you have a website, you know, a customer can just go and buy something. In, in Africa, people want to engage the customers first before they buy something. So one, one of the things that you would see in the slide that I, that I showed here is that 40% of all of the orders that we've noticed on Bumper is actually just from Instagram and WhatsApp. Yes, um, and this is through DMs, people engaging the customers before they make, they make the purchase. It's some of those nuances that we are designed for. You know, we released the integration last year, which is first on the continent, which is like where you get your DMs directly on, on Bumper and you can basically sell 50% um, faster than how you would sell normally by just, you know, um, using Instagram on its own. And so those are some of the things that we've been able to create that, you know, gives us that edge. And of course, there's the cost part of it. Like, um, that, that, that gives us another edge. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how'd you come up with the idea? So uh, myself and Aditya we were working at um, we're working at um, Host Cabal, um, where we basically help business owners, where we basically help developers, you know, host their solutions online. Um, and we started noticing something, which is the fact that you know, other than developers coming to us directly, we were getting entrepreneurs also coming to us. So first is that our customer base at the time was focused on developers. So they built their websites and they just want to host and that's all we were doing, hosting them. But now they wanted us to also build the website. And so we started building these websites for a few people. This was, this was actually back in 2018. Um, we were building these websites for people and then we just started figuring out how do we try to productize this such that we are not building a website for each person coming in. And again, there was Shopify, so we, we just basically try to um, bring that bring that down model um, in, a, in an easier way. So we we, we did it as a, as a side project, but in 2020, during the pandemic, um, with what, what was happening and business is not able to function um, the way they would like to, um, you know, my co-founder reached out to me and said, you know that project that we built that in 2018, you know, um, maybe it's time for us to release it. And then we started working on Bumper, and we released it in 2021. Oh, that's great. I think um, one of the things that I would encourage is lean into those unique insights and stories because when the questions, a couple of things, that, first of all, if it's Shopify for, you know, for Africa, say that. Like, that's good. <laughs> you know, that seems like a big company. Um, and your founding story, I think, gives you credibility. And the example of, you know, 40% of our customers come from these platforms already, and we make them be able to, like they're able to sell, you said something like twice as fast. Yeah. So this is a behavior that's already happening. We help them do it 2x as fast. That helps them get more money. Like those unique insights, I think, are what are really gonna, gonna shine. And so um, lean into the things that, like what do you know because of your own you know, personal experience, you know, um, presence in the market, your professional experience that others wouldn't know to be able to make this company very, very big and lean into those things because you, so, you um, definitely have some, I think, great content there. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Tanya Kotor, co-founder and CEO of West by East. We are an AI-powered design platform for custom-fit culture clothing. And before I dive in, I really want to paint a picture of why and how I'm building a $32 billion business. It all starts with a story about Kavya. And Kavya, like myself, is a first-generation Indian American, raised on a steady diet of Bollywood movies. She always envisioned herself as a traditional bride in a sari, and obviously doing a choreographed dance. But then the shopping started, and so did the nightmare. Kavya quickly realized that she didn't have the time or money to travel back to the motherland, so she tried to luck online, but when the offer came, it looked nothing like what she saw on the screen. <laughs> then she drove two hours to her nearest little India, like Addison, Jersey, and when she walked in, she realized everything was incredibly marked up, outdated, and nothing fit her either. 
And that's when she gave me a desperate phone call for help and West by East was born. Our solution is a seamless experience that is transparent, reliable, and can be done from the comfort of your own home. Our customers can design yourself, then they can take their phone and get their measurements done virtually in 60 seconds. We obtained their avatar to create a 3D rendering of the complete outfit on their actual body. And here's a virtual fashion show of the customer's ghost <laughs> mannequin. But this truly allows the customer to envision the final results before we even go into production. And here's the end result. Pretty cool, right? During the pandemic, we realized what we built has been transformative. We've sold over 1,500 units with a $3,500 AOV, 60% profit margin, and a $10,000 estimated LTV. Our customers become lifelong customers. My co-founder and I have 20 years of experience in luxury fashion and manufacturing, and now we're raising $1.2 million to be the market leader. And we're in the process of converting our production unit to a smart factory so we can become zero waste, zero inventory, zero human error, and a one-week turnaround time. And our big vision is to expand to other diasporas, like East Asian, African, Middle Eastern, so we can continue to sustainably preserve cultural heritage and surpass a $100 billion market size. Thank you. I love how you opened your presentation with, with like the comic strips, the visuals, really just like knocked it out of the park. So that was awesome, great presence. Um, and it seems like there's both like the problem from like needing to have uh, something that's like very custom, right? So people are very sticky because there's no other solution to find something like this. But then there's also like this very, very, I would say like proprietary technology piece to it of like AI uh, computer visioning. So I guess when you think about um, combining the two, um, why limit it to just cu custom clothing for like South Indian or even, um, I guess, other types of, call it like, uh, cultural clothing, like why not just use the technology, um, I guess, holistically to be able to render 3D avatars for anybody? Well, the reason I started the business is because of a personal pain point, yeah. and I really do believe this is a completely overlooked and underrepresented market that no one has figured out a solution for, mm -hmm. and the fact that you have to spend two grand just and take time off from work or school just to fly back to the motherland just to get a bunch of outfits, I, that's ridiculous. And so during, we, we launched right before the pandemic, and we were thriving because everyone's flight to the motherland got canceled, and so they had to shop virtually. And then I realized, like, this is a real business, and we're really solving a problem. Awesome. So how are you going to get in front of every single user, right? Like, what is that, like, top of funnel pipeline that you're thinking of? So we've grown organically. One customer brings us three more just because we do so, like, bulk orders. Um, so it's, like, if you went to a South Asian wedding, there's multiple people involved in the wedding party in multiple days. And so everyone, it's, it, ARV is $3,500 because that's 15 outfits, so at two fifty dollars a pop. So those people have an amazing experience, and those people come back to us for their upcoming nuptial or Diwali party or Eid. Um, and so that's how we've grown organically, but we are looking for a brand marketer um, to help us craft our story, work with content creators, um, really lean to our customer referral program to reward our awesome customers. And then we will always be digital first, but we want to become an omni-channel and um, host pop-up shops and short-term residencies to create more meaningful experiences. Awesome. Yeah, because given how high retention is and how large basket size is, but how low frequency of purchase is, and given that right now it's mostly organic, is kind of word of mouth is how you're selling it, I would definitely recommend thinking through some sort of like incentive model, like a give one, get one, or some sort of referral campaign, yeah. um, because I think they'll really like take it to the next level. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, I was not born a Deshpande, so <laughs> I have lived this moment. I had a big Indian wedding and uh -huh. had to outfit myself and my entire um, huge Midwestern family for yeah. the festivities. <laughs> um, so who, none of whom owned a single piece of yeah. appropriate cultural clothing for our wedding. So I've been there. Um, uh, d tell me about the kind of full stack. Do you do the manufacturing as well? Yeah, we're vertically integra integrated. Um, so our unit is in Gurgaon, India. Um, and so yeah, we're an end-to-end -end solution for custom, custom fit and on-demand clothing, using and, AI and robotics. And pulling on the thread of, of Joe's question, how important is that, you know, the AI, and it's impressive, it's a beautiful demo, and people literally said, wow, so um, I think that's, that's awesome. What I worry about when I see that sometimes is like, are we applying so much 
uh, you know, over-engineering the technology when the innovation is, is more maybe around the, the, the supply chain? How critical is a perfect, perfect avatar? Are these things arriving with no tailor needed? Are people still going to tailors? How important is the AI component of what you're doing? So traditionally how cultural clothing is bought, it's you, you see, you buy the fabric, you go to a tailor, like there is the element of feeling the clothes and trying it, everything on and doing alterations. So our customers, there's a confidence uh, moving forward with us, with our customers, because they get to actually see the outfit on their actual avatar, like their actual body shape. And then they're just like, okay, it looks great on me. Let's move forward. I'll make the payment kind of a deal. Are they still having it tailored when it arrives? Or no, it doesn't even require the tailoring? No, because it's oh, custom fit to their body. Yeah. yeah, and there's about two to three inches of allowance if you need to take it out if you gain weight. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's great. Really interesting. Nice job. Hey, how's everybody doing? Phenomenal. Quick question. How many of you love cardio fitness? Can't wait to go outside and go for a run. Who loves running in circles? No. <laughs> All right, so we got about <laughs> seven or eight liars in here. We got enough straight jackets for all the crazy people. But let's be honest. Cardio sucks. We all kind of know it, even if we don't want to admit it. And what we're trying to do is bring Pokemon go as gamification to cardio to make it a fun social activity for everyone. So, for all the people who don't like cardio didn't raise their hand, congratulations, Misery Loves Company. 77% of Americans don't get enough of this stuff. 47% don't even move 30 minutes a day. And when we talk to people who consistently do it, they mostly do it because they don't want to die of heart disease at 45. But a lot of them don't particularly love the process, and they got to find ways to trick themselves into liking it from social activities or thinking about the health benefits. For the inconsistent people like myself, I can't attribute heart disease. I'm 24 and I go to in and out too much, so I just don't want to do it, but I will play basketball. I will go and do these fun activities. And when I think about that and wonder about those two problems, I wonder, could we bring those two things together into a product to make it a fun social experience to motivate the people who need the extra motivation and then also help support the people who like that social engagement and helping make it for, more rewarding for what they're already doing. And what I thought was, could we make Pokemon Go a cardio fitness app? And so that's what we're doing. So let's imagine. We're going on a walk for our dog, and we're a part of this group here, ZFT Run Club. Now, as we're walking through, you can actually see we can claim that area from other teams. And we're turning part of a giant game of turf war by doing so. Where now, as you move through an area, you actually claim those areas for your team through your walking, running, and biking routes, while also still being able to hit those fitness stats of, walk, of calories, mile pace, distance, and all those other things. Now, on top of that, we can also make it a digital real estate opportunity for these groups, whether it be corporate wellness groups, run clubs, races, where now as they claim areas, that can actually be a launching pad for people to say, who's the FT Run Club? How'd they steal my block? And I can actually learn about that group and start driving digital traffic for their community members becoming their literal brand ambassadors and foot soldiers. As of today, we're already working with groups like the Cleveland Marathon, Austin Marathon. We just got our first corporate wellness deal with Oracle, and we already work with about 50 different run clubs. We launched three months ago, and on $4,800 of ad spend in three cities, we've been able, able to grow. Actually, these numbers are already out of date because it's 3,500 3, downloads now in 320 cities in 56 countries. In terms of our advisory board, working with the founder of Matt My Run, Pokemon Go's lead engineer, Adidas, director of innovation, and then executives from Zynga, Strava, Swift, and other groups. And we've raised about a million dollars in funding, including from Pokemon Go and angels from all those different groups. Uh, my ass slide is not on here, so I'm just going to say it out loud. But what we're looking to do is close a $2 million round and also connect with people in the fitness space who might be interested in making their cardio fitness a fun activity with their groups and communities. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the time. Uh, it's a great pitch. Nice job. Um, fitness is a um, notoriously challenging category because it's really competitive. Um, there's a lot of people trying to build new solutions. How do you think about acquiring uh, your customers and retaining them for this to be um, you know, a product they use for a very long time? Yeah, that's actually the question that I love answering the most because I think that's what strate strategically places a dif different from a group like Strava, Map My Run Club, Map My Run, Nike Run Club, et cetera, because we actually get our users from those run clubs wanting to create a team for their group, and they sell it for us. 
So one of the things we've been able to do is get groups like the Austin Marathon, the Cleveland Marathon, working on a deal with Chicago, the Brooks Running, and all these other groups who are paying us or giving us free space to promote it to their people in exchange for getting those people to use it and put their brand on the map which is why we've been able to grow so quickly in so many different places without actually being there or spending money on ads or anything else. And that's actually been a big part of how we've been able to grow very quickly with little ad spend. Yeah, I would, I would um, lean into that unique strategy and differentiation. I think if, um, you know, VCs have a lot of baggage when companies are pitching us because we've seen so many things that haven't worked over the years that all of a sudden you're like, I don't invest in fitness and travel and dating and gaming because this yeah. is the ways they fail. And so if you know that a VC has that baggage, Addressing it head on, I think, is a really authentic and builds credibility. Um, so to say, here is why we're different, and we sell through these, you know, into these running clubs for free, and that's how we get adoption. I would, I would put that. Other, I know it's difficult because you have a very short amount of time, so you probably yeah. had to cut. If um, you had five minutes, you, I would have laid off. Yeah. So, yeah. But, but as you think about that, and for yeah. others, you can lean in and just address the baggage that that you think people are already going to have. Um, and from your users, what data do you have to support? You've got 3,200 or 3,500 downloads. Um, what can you share about the actual people that have adopted and used and continue to use the product? What does that look like? Yeah, well, that's actually a really interesting part of it, too. We've tracked about 9,000 unique activities from those people. They've covered over 40,000 miles mm -hmm. in about 320 different cities. And one of the things we found is that it's a wide group. We've got marathoners who are running sub mm -hmm. four mm -hmm. miles. We've got people who are walking their dog at a mile, at an hour mile pace. Mm -hmm. We've got people who are 15 years old who are with a high school track team. Our oldest user and one of our top users in terms of like miles covered and blocks captured is a 78 year old hiker. So the range of all the ways that people use it, what they use it for and why they care is so wide mm -hmm. that it makes us feel very confident that pretty much if we shoot at a target and put a lot of extended effort into it, we can find an opportunity there. We've already got our first corporate wellness mm -hmm. contract with Oracle. We've got about four dozen run clubs using it. We've got free partnerships, or even paid partnerships from groups like Austin Marathon, Cleveland Marathon, talking to Chicago and New York as well about using it with their races. And uh, we're just getting started and haven't really built out a functioning product in every single way that a Strava or Nike run club has, and yet has still had those groups wanting to spend money to use it for their parties in all these different ways. Just one quick question. <clears throat> Do you have a sense of what's the minimum group size you need to make this work? Because we've, I've seen a bunch of single player yeah. fitness apps where you don't need anybody else, it's just you, but this seems to only work if you've got that group dynamic. Do you have a sense of how the minimum size of a group you need to make something effective? Yeah, that's actually a good question too. So we haven't really found that the group size mattered more so the type of people in that group. One of our top groups is an eight person run club in Cincinnati of 75 plus year old retirees and they've covered more miles than like the ROTC teams, the <laughs> army teams, the actual run clubs because they just enjoy painting the map with their colors. They just, mm -hmm. and like, they don't, some of them don't even know how it works. So we had a user interview with them. He's like, yeah. yeah, I don't know what's happening, but I like seeing the map go whoosh. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> me too, I love whoosh. Uh, yeah. So uh, for the group, it really depends on the connectivity of it and then also the competitive nature of who's in that area. We've got groups as big as 500. We've got groups as small as two. We've even got like small startup teams that just use it with their three you know, co-founders mm -hmm. and they cover more miles than some of the 50 person run clubs. Yeah. I think so when, when you have variable. interesting kind of counterintuitive insights like that, those are great things to work into the pitch. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank Hi everyone, my name is Kyla Bolden and I'm the founder and CEO of WizKit Learning. So WizKit Learning is an online learning platform and community for future focused learners. We deliver computer science STEM classes to kids K through 12 by actually partnering with youth focused organizations. So everything from a school to a boys and girls club to a city. So far we've had a lot of great traction. So we have st worked with over 8,000 students from over 30 different countries. We recently just closed our seed round of a little over a million dollars. And we've had some amazing notable partners from over 20 North American cities. We have an awesome team with startup experience, educational experience, and technical experience. And then going into a little bit why I started this company. So I grew up in Bermuda. I did a lot of sports, and it was easy for my family to find coaches for me to get better at my sport. However, I was also obsessed with technology. So I got a computer at the age of seven. I taught myself how to code. However, there were no programs that I could actually go into to get better at this. 
And I thought this was a problem just because I lived in a really small country. But years later, kids are actually experiencing this problem all over the world. So it begs the questions, where can kids learn, socialize, and develop these key future focus skills? We know that schools have trouble providing them due to teacher shortages, as well as the quick pace of how quickly technology moves. So we are the solution to that. So we deliver online coding in some classes that are live and asynchronous to schools and organizations. Um, we have built a really awesome platform that allows schools and organizations to be able to implement these classes within their, within their schools and organizations. So we really are a full service platform when it comes to their coding and STEM needs. Uh, a little bit about our product. So we have uh, over 35 different courses uh, and we educate kids K through 12. So we're able to help schools really take on their computer science needs without them having to worry about um, having a computer science in the um, teacher in the classroom. So we have a growing partnership value. So the way we make money is by partnering with these organizations and schools. Our partnerships range from 20K to 50K a year. And over the years, we have seen an increase in that. So now we're seeing partnerships about 75K. When it comes to the market, this market is definitely huge. And that coupled with the fact that teacher shortages are happening, there's a growing demand for computer science. And many schools cannot keep up with the fast pace of how quickly computer science needs are changing. Uh, we really feel that WizKid is primed to really um, help schools be able to capture this need to provide quality computer science education. So, our ask is really introductions to school boards as well as introductions to investors. We're not currently raising, but we are going to be raising soon. And thank you. <clears throat> this was super interesting, Kala. I had a question for you. What else are these schools considering as alternatives when they're looking at WizKid? Like, what are the other things that are on? Yeah, the so. Menu most ed tech companies that are competitors of ours, they're either marketplaces where they are connecting the teacher to the school or their curricular, um, the curriculum company. So they're mm -hmm. actually providing them curriculum. So that's typically the two that they are considering. Uh, with us, we're very full service. So we're able to provide both the instructor, the curriculum, as well as the platform to actually deliver it. And do you have a sense for why, most, why they choose you in the end in those competitive situations? Yeah, I think it's really the fact that we kind of solve the full problem. Um, it's not just the curriculum. Many uh, schools try to implement computer science curriculum and try to get teachers that don't know how to code to teach them. Uh, like, it's like me, I don't know how to speak Spanish and I cannot teach a Spanish class, um, but they try to do it for computer science. So I think we're really full service and we take the problem off their hands, really. Thank you. Um, I love that logo. The slide that you have with all the logos that was oh. very impressive. Mm -hmm. um, when you think about acquiring um, the instructors that you have, how do you uh, how do you train them up and how do you suss out quality? And maybe like the tack on question is when you think about like of the existing solutions, how big for an instructor is the class that they're teaching, mm -hmm. and um, and how much cheaper is it for the students to, to use your solution? Sorry, there's like three questions there, yeah. <laughs> but I want to kind of get the whole picture. Of course. So I think the first one was around. Um, the instructors, yes. who they are. Yeah. So at first we were hiring computer science students, so okay. in their later years of university. Then we went on to hire computer science like graduates, maybe a master's program. And so they have that technical expertise. Mm -hmm. um, they also have to have years of experience teaching. So that's another barrier that we um, put in there. And then we actually train them on our curriculum. So not just how to deliver the courses, but as well as to be like instructor mentors, that we what we call them. So build education tenacity and confidence within our students. So they go through that rigorous training process before they're actually allowed to be in the classroom. And they're paid hourly or they're paid a salary? Yeah, so they're paid hourly. We are introducing more asynchronous hybrid courses into our platform just because that one to 10 student um, instructor student ratio, we understand like that's not incredibly scalable going into the future. So um, we are implementing some programs where we'll, they'll be actually um, like uh, videos of the courses rather than all just completely live. Mm -hmm. And so like compared to like, you know, there's a lot of like coding boot camps or like there are other like call it synchronous live um, 
call it instructor-led courses for computer science, like VIP Kids or by Jews. Mm -hmm. Is your class size smaller or more curated, and is yeah. it cheaper for the students? Yeah. So when it comes to like VIP Kids and Baiju, they do more tutoring, so like mm -hmm. one to one. Ours is one to ten, so and we are actually more focusing on teaching courses, um, like in classes inside the school. So um, that's kind of the difference in class structure. And then I would say we more compare ourselves to what it will cost to actually have a computer science teacher in the school. So that sometimes ranges between 60 to 70K, depending on you know what quality teacher that you want. And then that's typically only one teacher that could quit, and then your whole computer science program mm -hmm. is gone, right? Yeah. Which that actually happens to a lot of our customers. So that's why they utilize us. I love that. I feel like there could be a slide kind of walking through the competitive landscape of like, yeah. here are like synchronous solutions like Baiju's, but then mm -hmm. it's not as targeted, right? It's more like tutoring. Mm -hmm. You have like coding boot camps like General Assembly, but those are like very large and a lot of it is like more async, right? Yeah. So I think that will give me like a very clear like picture of like what differentiates you. Mm -hmm. um, and you wouldn't have that follow-on question from me afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> but awesome. Thank you. Thank you. At the age of 10, I was playing basketball, selling ice cream, and cutting checks, <laughs> payroll checks. My parents had a taqueria, original name, Tacos Garcia, and they had a problem. The needs that they had for their business weren't being met because they were immigrants, they spoke Spanish, they were small business owners. Years later, I began selling payroll door-to-door -door in San Francisco, and what I discovered is that I had a superpower. I could sell businesses, payroll, benefits that no one else could. My name is Arthur Garcia, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Tres, the first payroll platform that serves the fastest growing segment in the US market, US Latinos. Existing providers aren't meeting the needs of the market. Payroll is complicated, and they're not providing adequate bilingual support. They use a one-size-fits-all approach to benefits and they lack a cultural connection and a human relationship. This is why I'm excited. Thanks to research from Stanford, we know this data, right? <laughs> that Latino businesses are growing at 44% faster than the non-Latino cohort. There's five and a half million Latino businesses in the US and a workforce that represents 18% of the US economy at 35 million. At Tres, we're providing cultural relevant service that provides payroll, benefits, and finance, tres. Since starting, at, at, uh, since starting with Techstars in February, we've grown to 80 customers that they employ 300 employees. We're backed, uh, I also met my co-founder here on campus at Stanford during the Slay Ed program, and we have processed over $2 million in payroll to date. As I mentioned, uh, I met my co-founder here. He was running an accounting firm, and I was running a tax franchise. I've worked at Paychex. I have built payroll at zero, and I also consulted at Gusto. And the aha moment for me was when a, an accounting firm reached out to me and said, Arturo, can you help me move my 60 clients to Gusto? So I text my friends, and I said, do you have any Spanish-speaking salespeople? They said no. Then I said, do you have any Spanish-speaking support people that can help onboard 60 clients? Do you want them? And they said, no. So <laughs> at Tres, we are, are serving the fastest growing market, and we're seeking introductions to benefit experts, advisors, and potential investors. Next time you eat tacos, think of payroll, and remember Tres. <laughs> This is like such a beautiful like founder market fit moment. Like the, the way that you tell the story, the way that your history bleeds into into you know your pitch was awesome. Um, I think for for me, an open question I have is I think you mentioned okay, so there's existing like providers like Gusto or Rippling, and the issue right now is that they don't have Spanish speaking support. I'd love to know like other than like the language component to it, what are some other moats of Tres that's specific to the Latino market? Sure. Well, the, the interesting thing is that uh, legislation can, is providing a tailwind for us. So payroll is just table stakes, but we get into benefits like the state mandate CalSavers. Mm -hmm. 
there's 12 other states that have these state mandates that are coming. Mm -hmm. But even legislation like Secure 2.0 that makes it easier and more cost effective for business to offer 401k. Mm -hmm. Challenge is there's nobody providing those open enrollment meetings. Mm -hmm. And they're not really going out to do open enrollments for five, six employees, right? So there's that cultural and language gap that exists today. Mm -hmm. So like language is, is truly kind of the moat for this. Language, but also that cultural connection. We surveyed 100 Latino and Latina businesses and they said beyond language, we just want to work with someone that gets us. Yeah, trust, absolutely. Yeah. Related to that, um, the payroll market tends to be segmented as, as you know, by company size. And so when you're in the today version and sort of the future version, what's the sort of upper and lower bound for the size enterprises that you want to serve? Sure. So we're focused on businesses that are size uh, 20 employees or less. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of unrealized innovative value that isn't reaching uh, the employees. And I'm talking about s simple things like an online check stub, yeah. which makes it hard for an employee when they're applying for a loan to get the three months of check stubs or to get that W-2 that mm -hmm. they need to apply for these things. So we want to make it simple, easy, so that the business owners can do it and not rely on a family member even a 10-year-old yeah. to, to, do, to process a payroll or call the, the benefits company. And given the size of those customers, like how do you think about reaching them efficiently over time? Yeah, so one of the things that we know is that we need to demonstrate the ability to acquire these customers at a lower acquisition cost. Mm -hmm. And with my experience selling into accounting firms, we know that they are the most trusted advisor in the market. Mm -hmm. So because of my experience in my network, that is our first uh, go-to-market channel, which is accounting firms. And when I say accountants, I'm not talking about CPA firms. I'm talking about tax professionals that have these sole proprietors, that have these S-corps that are like, I have employees, I gotta pay them, ayúdame por favor, right? <laughs> so, so that's where we fit in nicely uh, in acquiring customers. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Trini Van Susan. I'm the founder of T Read. At T Read, we use AI and speech recognition to help children speak and read English. And over the last six months, we have grown to serve thousands of students throughout, throughout the world through distribution deals. And our students are learning twice as fast as a typical student. 90% of the world doesn't speak English proficiently or natively. And for parents, having their kids learn English can be the difference between their kids living their life, living paycheck to paycheck, or actually achieving their dreams. The thing is, learning English hasn't changed since I was an English teacher in Argentina 14 years ago. A theory we use AI to accelerate and amplify any English program. And the way we do this is we assess how students are speaking and reading English, we pair them with the right materials, and we pair them as well with our AI coach that helps students grow by giving them live feedback. And now, uh, we, well, a lot of you might know how hard it is to sell to schools, uh, which is why the way we grow is through partnerships. We have robust partnerships with local education distributors around the world, global publishers, and large school operators. We're building a strong foundation for a business that profits from unlocking the untapped potential of humanity. 6.4 billion people don't speak English. This means that there's 6.4 billion people that don't get access to make a choice to improve their lives. We're building a new world where everyone gets a choice, and if you wanna be part of that world, please come talk to me. Thank you. I like that you addressed head on that selling to schools is hard, because <laughs> it is so hard. Um, and I feel like for so long, we've thought about this idea of like personalizing education, and now with the advent of large language models, we actually can do that. So maybe we can like talk about like how exactly you're able to do that. Like what, what is kind of like that end-to-end, -end, um, yeah, like solution. Yeah, so we partner with a school and with our English program. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of schools struggle to hire teachers. I know that's, imagine if that's a problem here in the US, internationally, hiring English language teachers is almost impossible. 
So what we do is we offer them a way of personalizing that, uh, that training to the students. So we take a student, they go and through our assessments, we're able to identify to the specific sound level how students are speaking and what are the type of mistakes that they're making when they're reading. Mm -hmm. And after we do that, we personalize a whole library of books similar to what Epic did. Uh, but a lot more personalized, specific where they can, what they can do. And we have a lot of questions that we're constantly asking to see how they're doing. And we funnel all that information to the teacher with recommendations. And that's absolutely key because a lot of these teachers don't know what to do. Got it. And then our AI coach does all the training to them. Uh, so even teachers don't have to do it, which is absolutely key as well because a lot of teachers don't want to add more work to what they're already doing. Mm -hmm. And how do you target uh, the mispronunciations? Is it like a speech to text transcription or are you using whisper? Like how are you identifying like what is misspoken? Yeah, so what we do is we have a um, different API so we work and the, the magic on how we work is how we utilize that information, especially when you're thinking about so many accents that we deal with because we have schools all over the world. Um, and even within a certain region, there might be several accents as well. Uh, so that's how we utilize that information. We process it. And after that, we provide the recommendations. And also, we coach the students. So we give them through conversations, live feedback. Mm -hmm. um, and we engage them to, through multisensorial exercises to get them better. Got it. Yeah, I don't know if your product is live or not, but I feel like this is a perfect product to have like a 10 second or even like 20 second demo reel of like a student like speaking with an accent or mispronouncing and then having live feedback of like how they improve over time. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that feedback. Yeah, yeah. We usually have it. I thought two minutes was that's too fair. short. Absolutely. But, yeah. Yes. Um, that's a that's a wonderful point. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, yes. Uh, can you tell us more about your it sounds like you do have a live product that's in market. Can you tell us a little bit more about kind of the current state of that traction you have? Yeah, we have over 5,000 students. We, I pivoted six months ago. First, we were focusing in the US more than anything as a, uh, addressing the literacy crisis. Uh, but getting to schools in the US was really hard. And what we were seeing on the data was that the students that were growing the fastest were students for whom they were, the English was not their first language or their parents' first language. Um, and right when we were addressing that, we started getting a lot of inbounds from international schools. And I started seeing like, hey, where there's smoke, there's fire. Um, and we started talking to international schools. And all of a sudden after that, we, this was around six months ago, end of Q3, start of Q4. Um, and we started getting deals with distribution, uh, with educational distributors in the different countries. So now we have deals in India, Brazil, Colombia, uh, Mexico, which is one of our biggest markets. Uh, a bunch of countries with Central America, and we're growing really fast. We more than tripled the platform within the last few months, and we're, that's only with pilots. So every pilot is 10 times more students. Uh, so we believe that we're gonna even, the very, very uh, humble numbers is that we're gonna at least triple again within the next three months. That's wonderful, congratulations on your progress so far. Thank you. Um, I think uh, language and, um, uh, you know, whether learning of language or translation is, um, you know, a common and, and great application of AI technology, um, given that other people will try, will try this or some, you know, uh, version of this. What do you think is your lasting competitive advantage? That's a wonderful question. Uh, so a lot of it is the relationships that we're creating with the schools, but also how we're tracking the accents. So even when I was doing reading interventions, uh, my, all my, my first schools were in New York City with schools that spoke up to 44 languages within the school. Uh, so I was, in, and that was by choice. I wanted to start tracking those accents and seeing how my technology was working with that. Uh, and that is definitely a big competitive advantage to the extent that now I'm getting a lot of inbounds from big companies here in the US wanting to use our technology for their products. Um, and and that's definitely a big, big competitive advantage. The second one is that there's not, selling to schools is so hard that because we did it through partnerships, we're getting into those schools. And when 
I, I start pitching and, and giving my demo, they start thinking, okay, reading, because that's what they were trained to do, and there was nothing in the market before for speaking. Mm. So when I say, hey, this is an amazing platform for reading, but here speaking, they're speechless. Mm -hmm. um, so getting into, that, uh, getting into that relationship as soon as possible has been key as well. That's a great answer. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lauren Burke Silva, CEO and co-founder of Matchplicity. We help associations build, grow, and monetize their communities. So this was my email inbox two years ago. I was getting inundated with emails from corporate recruiters who were eager to source talent from my membership population. As a professional for a, um, as an executive as a, of a professional membership organization called NABA, uh, with 7,000 members in that organization, I needed good technology that was gonna help ease the administrative burden of having to manually connect corporate partners with our members. I also needed to have a non-dues revenue opportunity that could help support the mission of my organization. So this is a problem that not just my organization has, but that 120,000 other US-based organizations have in the US. So the thing about associations is they have a really keen ability to be able to tap into and to monetize their niche communities. What they need is a technology to help them build, grow, and monetize their communities. In that case, enter Matchplicity. We deliver talent directly to corporations through niche communities like associations. Our B2B SaaS platform allows these associations to be able to connect their corporate partners with them directly using our proprietary algorithm. The users simply create prep, uh, set up a profile preference, they set their skills, they set their background and desired career paths, and the system matches them together. We launched our beta uh, with our, the organization I used to work for in March of 2021. They were making $50,000 a year using a generic association job board. In eight months, we took that $50,000 to $800,000 in revenue. That yielded Matchplicity $300,000 in our first year. Today, we have four association clients that we're working on replicating those same successes with. We have 3,400 jobs posted on the platform, 3,000 systems user um, system-wide, uh, and then 140 employers that are actively engaged. So we're looking to build relationships uh, with investors as we start to open up a pre-seed round. So if that sounds like you, then scan the QR code and connect with me later. Thanks. Um, great job, and I love the personal experience and story of kind of how you found this problem and solved it for something that was yourself. Um, uh, Tell me how you think about the market size of your opportunity. I did see a market size mm -hmm. slide. Um, how do you think about the broad market opportunity here? Yeah, so the pitch that we, um, when we go to our associations, they work with companies who are the actual buyers, is that it's we're really going after the staffing market. So it's $152 billion that staffing organizations are generating revenue every year. Um, we focus on four specific verticals, and that market size is about $63 billion. So, what, we, um, what we're doing is providing a wholesale opportunity for these companies to access talent in very decentralized niche communities and to be able to do that by saving money and not spending with, with staffing agencies and spending it on with these associations and, and through Matchplicity. There's, there's two things I wonder if you might be kind of underselling about what you're doing that are kind of these immediate flags for VCs that um, I, I think might not be true and you could just kind of get around them. One is kind of the, the repetition of this idea of niche. Because it's like, like there, maybe each individual thing is niche, but as a group, it's not niche, right? right? Um, and so I think I think um, that, and also um, you know the market size. This is unfair for a lot of businesses, but if you want to raise venture capital, it's the reality is I need to see a market size with a B, mm -hmm. and you know, and, and ideally it's a big number. And so um, thinking about even when I'm just doing the back of the envelope on how much revenue you've done so far with certain organizations and how many of them you said there are. I would think that the number is, is bigger than the 700 million you had on the slide. And so um, yeah. I think one of the things that you can do is um, think about how could this be the biggest possible market size that it could ever possibly be 
that you actually believe. Mm -hmm. And so there does have to be some like realism and right. grounding in like, you know, because if you're like, oh, it's a $5 trillion market, I'm like, okay, now I don't believe you. Right, right. right. But, but so what's the biggest possible market and vision that you could paint yeah. that you really believe could be true? Yeah. Um, and, and that may help if you um, can kind of level that up, then it, it removes the ability of a VC to see, you know, a million and just be like, not big enough for me. Right. Um, and right. just kind of, um, yeah. I will do that. Thank so. you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the, the two questions that I was left with, one was like, what does it take to onboard these communities? Because yes. they already have their own membership. They pres presumably that data lives somewhere. And what's yeah. that migration? And then just a really clear, simple statement of the business model. I saw that. I saw that 16x. I'm like, wow, you're doing something right, that's yeah. really working. I want to make sure I know how to, to Sarah's point, so I can then tie that to. Well, does that actually tie to the market size that you mentioned? Yeah. So um, for the the um, business model question, we do a revenue share with the association. Sure. So they charge the companies, they pay a subscription. They might pay twenty thousand dollars for the year, whatever that is, and then we we split that revenue with them, um, typically forty sixty percent. Um, and then your other question, I'm sorry, your first question. About onboarding the membership? Yes, so onboarding, yes. Yeah, so that is actually one of um, one of the things that we're working on with the association that we really want to streamline as before we really start to scale. Yeah. So what we're doing is really analyzing each association that we're working with in this initial cohort. They're all a little bit different and going to market differently. So we're just mapping that out and making sure that that process is applicable across, you know, the majority of associations in those profiles and then you know, automating that. But um, typically they're taking, we give them a toolkit, they're promoting it to their communities, and then they're joining the, um, joining the platform. Thank you. Yeah.